Hey guys, if you're, uh, if you're here for Professor Soccer, have a seat. This one's short and sweet, but, uh, okay, sir. Okay. Uh, Faisal Tamish is, uh, is with Dev Security. Um, he's going to talk a little bit today about, um, sorry, um, he's going to talk a little bit, a little bit today about, um, both platform owners, so, uh, I'm just going to pass the mic to you, and that's your role, kid. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Faisal, and uh, the title looks a little different. It's Medical Exploitation. That's actually the title of the blog, but uh, you were at the right talk for Health Platform Ponage. So this talks about a recent project that we did at Depth, and basically... Uh, we were able to exploit a glucometer, which is a device that measures your blood sugar level. You poke yourself in the finger, uh, it measures your blood sugar, and then it synchronizes with a mobile device, and then that synchronizes up to the cloud. Great. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a penetration tester and I do some security research. Uh, my interests are in uh, red teaming, intelligent fuzzing, uh, reverse engineering, and binary exploitation. So I like, these are not things that I'm great at, I'm always trying to improve in. Uh, and then when I'm 40 and retired, and this will make sense in a bit, uh, I'd like to look into sentient intelligence and uh, like the primal cerebral connection in the brain. So it's not just doing algorithms and stuff, I'd like my fridge to talk back to me and call me out on my crap. So, Something else that I like is uh, combat sports and music, so if you'd like to come talk to me, let's talk about that. So a little bit of backstory about uh, the actual project. Uh, our CTO and hacker in chief, Jake Reynolds, uh, wanted to come up with some research projects for us to do. And uh, one idea he had was this glucometer. And that black looking device thing in the middle, that's the actual hardware device that I was talking about just earlier. And we thought it would be impactful research because if there are some security flaws in this, it would affect the health industry and we'd like to contribute to that in some way if possible. So the attack vectors for the glucometer obviously are how the Bluetooth device, you know, the actual hardware device, synchronizes to the cell phone. So that's one thing we could look at and Bluetooth always sounds super sexy. It's like, wow, let's do some Bluetooth hacking. Or there's also the uh, web exploit, mobile exploitation aspect, which is like, how does, how, how securely does the mobile device synchronize its data to the cloud? So the summary here is that through five low or medium severity vulnerabilities, uh, we were able to compromise every single user's data and modify any user's data on the platform. That includes their uh, glucose level readings and their required daily insulin dosage. So this is where we start getting a little bit more technical, and this is the first vulnerability. So the way the device talks to the back end, right, uh, the first thing we had to bypass was certificate pinning. So there was certificate pinning implemented, and what that means is this. In order for us to look at the requests that are happening from the cell phone device back to the back end server, we need to proxy it through some sort of program, you know, like BERP or something. Now the program will actually check to see if it's talking to the right Thing to the right server, the right backend, before it allows, before it actually sends any requests. So we need to bypass that. There are a couple of ways to do that. Sometimes, if the certificate is placed uh, in a predictable location, uh, somewhere in the root directory or something like that, um, then we are able to change it and have the program actually utilize the certificate. Um, there's also runtime hooking using a tool like Frida, and uh, I highly recommend you guys check out uh, James Kennedy's talk in a little bit. He'll be going through the mobile stuff in a lot more detail than I will be. Um, I believe that's at 4.15. The way that we did it was uh, using the Burp Mobile Assistant, and this is a tool that basically is the easy button where you're able to inject into an app of your choosing, and then now you can bypass certificate pinning, and you can look at any requests happening from the uh, cell phone device to the back end. So I know I know the post requests, the get requests, any web request that's happening, I can look at that pretty easily. Great. Now the second uh, vulnerability is a pretty common 
uh, web application vulnerability. It's uh, IDOR, or Insecure Direct Optic References. And basically, when you're logged in as one user, I have an ID, and that typically correlates to the user that I'm looking at. That's how the web application works. But we were able to change that user ID to any other number, and that returned a different user's information. But there was a catch. The information that came back was encrypted, and that means that the chunks of encryption looked different from user to user. It wasn't straight up that information. You didn't just get back the information. And here's a little bit of a screenshot. I don't know how clear it is, but the arrow that points to the top there, that's basically a request response uh, repeater verb tab thing. But you change the user ID at the top, you get a different encrypted blob at the bottom. So by changing the user ID, you get a different encrypted blob. So that's a good hypothesis at this point that, hey, this might be somebody else's data. Great. So we need to dig deeper. Great. So the third vulnerability now, by digging deeper, we need to break the encryption. So in order to do so, we need to start reverse engineering the mobile application. Of course, all of this was happening on a uh, jailbroken iPhone or Android, which is a prerequisite in order to do the hooking stuff or any of that fun stuff I talked about earlier. Our reversing options are, you know, there's the iOS application and the Android application. We could either work with the IPA, and the IPA is basically going to entail reversing uh, ARM assembly, and that's a little more sophisticated, and that's not the simplest route to go about this. Reversing is fun, but I don't really want to do more work than I have to if there's a simpler way. So the other way is uh, reversing the Android APK, and this is where the weak obfuscation comes. There are ways that you can obfuscate your app that makes it really, really difficult for reverse engineers to try to figure out what's going on. But, I put obfuscate in quotes, because as you can see, this is a sample, you can look at the log messages here. They basically explain what every method does. I don't even have to figure out, I don't have to go any deeper. This is literally it. This is an encryptor, this is a decryptor. And then also, it's telling me the cipher uh, instance that I need to use, so the, the encryption type. Great, so the highly descriptive log messages kind of rendered any obfuscation useless. So even if the variable names are different, you know, the method names don't mean anything, well, I know exactly what they're doing so I can easily fill in the blanks. We know what the encryption scheme is now, so the next step we need to figure out is for this specific encryption scheme, we need an initialization vector and an encryption key. Okay, we need to dig deeper. So it turns out, as you'll see in the next screenshot there, that um, there is a statically coded encryption key, which is a vulnerability by itself. Encryption keys should be come up sometime during runtime that makes it really hard for a reverse engineer to figure out what it is. Even if that algorithm itself comes up with the same key over and over again, but it should be really difficult to figure that part out. And the second part was that the initialization vector was also statically coded, and IVs should be used as a nuts. That is a number that is used once. You can't keep that static. So after a little bit of more reversing, uh, I blurred them out, but you can see here the uh, encryption key and then the initialization vector, and they're re reused throughout the code base. And it looks a little funky here because of the reverse engineering uh, tool that I used. Uh, it's not very straightforward, but it gives you a good general idea. Okay, so now we have all the things we need to break the encryption. We have access to any user's encrypted data. We have the encryption scheme. We have the encryption key and the initialization vector. So let's go ahead and write a little bit of code, but there are some challenges. So first thing is, if you look at the actual program, you'll notice that there's some base64 encoding happening. So first thing, we need to base64 decode it. Uh, then we need to interpret the actual decryption key in the right format. Otherwise, if we just plug it into our uh, decryption program, it's not really going to make much sense. So in this case, UTF-16 LE. Now the part that took me three days and really amplifies my hatred for Java some more was the fact that I had the wrong Java library installation, the wrong version, and so I couldn't really decrypt the message using the key length and IV length that I had. Except my coworker, Corey Shea, who tried pretty much the same exact script on his program, 
and his Java installation was updated, and then he was able to break it, so that's awesome. And then Dan also, who's uh, running our CTF, he came up with a Python implementation. And by the way, that's really cool. So we have a show and shell every week at Depth, which is cool uh, because you know we go in and we show off what we did. Like these are most hacks. And then if we have any problems, you know, it's things that were at roadblocks. Well, we help each other out, and we kind of have this really strong hive of minds that are just working together. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, so. We have the scripts, let's actually do some proof of concepts. The first one is really simple, and that's the data retrieval. So we can grab some medical data, uh, personal information, uh, but the question is, can we actually modify any user's data? Because that's the next step. So here's the Python script that's using the encryption key, uh, initialization vector, as well as you know, the encryption scheme we mentioned earlier. You put in that stuff that doesn't make sense and you come up with a JSON object. Awesome. Now this is only one request of many. So this is showing the basic profile information like the date of birth, the username, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. But there are other requests that happen and what they do is they synchronize your glucose level readings, your, you know, what basically if you do it 28 times a day or whatever you're required to do, there's a log of all that that gets pushed to the cloud, which may be inspected by a medical professional. This is basically just showing that from the same user we're logged in, we change the user ID, we grab a different encrypted blob, and we decrypted that just as a POC to show that, hey, we have a different user's information. I need to point out, though, that this is not real user information. We created two test accounts before we started messing with any patient's data, just so we didn't want to touch any patient's data. We just wanted to have two test accounts and have fake values so we don't touch any production data. Great. So data tampering, uh, we're interested in uh, basically if we can change the amount of dosage that you need of insulin, uh, what your glucose readings are, and there's an interesting account takeover you can do because there's a password reset flag and you can change the email address. So if I set the email address to mine and I set the password reset flag to true, then I'm going to get an email and I'm going to change the person's password and now I have access to their account. Um, the biggest thing here is that you can modify data over time. And this could be problematic in an attack scenario that I'm going to show in a bit, and it could affect the person's medical prognosis. So they might come up as, you know, they might need more insulin than they actually need, or, or they might be given more insulin than they actually need, or they might not be given enough insulin. So this is a couple of, uh, I guess, variables in the uh, JSON object that you could change, and this is just one request where you have the total daily uh, dosage and then the uh, inject insulin, how much you're supposed to do that. And then there's also a reminder, which is an interesting part. Basically, some elderly people, they get a reminder on their phone, hey, remind them 28 times a day to measure their insulin. Well, if you set that to zero, an elderly, uh, an elderly person might not do that. So, a tax scenario. Grandma is rich and her ethically questionable grandkids want some inheritance money to come a little sooner. So you basically figure out what grandma's user ID is and then you have access to all of her uh, glucose readings and how much insulin she needs every day. Uh, if you do that over time, let's say you get a one month trial, you know, if you're measuring your blood sugar level to actually figure out how much insulin you need, um, you can actually affect that so that when they go in for the next appointment, they're like, well, you're actually not that, you know, you, your diabetes or how much insulin you need is not that much, so we're going to reduce your required dosage. And that could actually cause some health issues. Rest in peace, Grandma, she died recently. Okay, so, the timeline for this, and a lot of people are, uh, underestimate, is that these things take like a day or two to do, you know, like you find a cool O day on Twitter and then you get a lot of credit and <laughs> CVs, but it actually takes a long time. It takes about six to eight months because you have to give the uh, company three months of responsible disclosure. You know, you can't tell anybody and you have to work with them to help remediate it. Uh, if that's a thing that you'd like to do, you know, it takes time. Um, so. I disclosed in October 15th of 2018, and we didn't publicly disclose this until 
February 14th, which was pretty recently, and that doesn't include any of the research time. So the one thing that I guess my takeaway for this is um, none of these vulnerabilities could stand on their own. And in fact, if you want to, if you did a pen test or a mobile application assessment, whatever, and uh, you said, you know, you have these vulnerabilities, some people will not be inclined to fix these because they're low severity. They're like, well, we're going to fix mediums and above. But hacking is not necessarily just finding that, you know, one cool vulnerability and you take it, you know, this is a critical severity vulnerability, fix it. No, hacking is an art. When you hire a hacker, you're hiring an artist, and they're chaining exploits together. Uh, vulnerabilities, actually, like low severity vulnerabilities to eventually bring down an entire corporation. So this is a job for humans. And you know, this company I talked to the guys, they had run, they had a reasonable security program, but I mean, they only used scanners and they didn't really hire legitimate pen testers to do that. So. This is an art, and it's a job for humans. Anyway, uh, that's all. It's, uh, I'll take any questions. Basil rhymes with basil, so. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have a question. When you start thinking about the cost of a vulnerability or of penetration, particularly in medical devices, how do you start accepting that cost, or how do you do the client? So risk assessment, um, that's something you should ask for a CISO, but <laughs> I'll answer that question. So uh, trying to figure out what's worth what is really hard, it's always subjective. I mean, if you, you know, what, what's the value of a human life if you talk to a lawyer, right? And they'll come up with some value based on the context. But uh, the thing that concerns me is that uh, people are taking security, uh, they're becoming more complacent. And people keep saying things like, oh, well, uh, we're commoditizing testing. You know, we're, we're, we're making all these uh, scanners and they're super smart, AI, machine learning this, fuzzy logic that. But at the end of the day, the more complacent you become, the more the hackers that really know what they're doing, you're making them super powerful. And that's not something that we want. We want to be able to hire people that are really capable on the white and on the white hat side and then say, okay, show us what you got, show us what you can do, and you know, in terms of cost, it really depends on context. You know, there's no really good answer for that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. In this case, what was the cost for the one behind this line? So actually the uh, the organization was really friendly to work with, uh, but in this case, we had, you know, you can count between 2.5 to 5 million records of people that, you know, we have access to all their uh, glucose readings, uh, insulin requirements. I don't know what that would translate to a per record value, but let's say that each record, you know, the government fined them $10. I mean, if you just do the math there, I think, uh, any CISO is going to want to be like, okay, I think it's going to cost a lot cheaper to hire some actual hackers to figure out what's wrong with our stuff. So, any others? Yes, ma'am. Were there any other devices that you had identified in, in the medical arena that were also potentially exploitable? So, uh, when we do research on a device, it's usually just that device and how it interacts you know, with that surrounding the people or the backend servers, anything like that. So I, I can't say whether other devices are exploitable or not until we do research and try to figure out, you know, are they actually exploitable? But I can tell you right now that, um, I think Leslie mentioned this this morning too, is that um, the, the culture right now with IoT and health devices and all that kind of stuff, they're trying to push as fast as possible because that's just the startup thing. Push fast, push fast. Nobody really thinks twice about security and what the possible implications are in the long run. And I bet you that in the health industry there are hundreds if not thousands of other devices that are just as vulnerable or even worse because they're probably connected, you know, like, uh, like some uh, life vital monitoring system for kids at a hospital, you know. People probably haven't done much research for that, but with the right nation state that's well funded and they really want to do some damage, yeah, things could be pretty bad. So, 
but that's kind of the world we live in. <laughs> so, Any other so questions? Based on this vulnerability, would you recommend that people stop using this device? Uh, so that's not something I, I would not say that because now these vulnerabilities have been patched. Um, now, for me myself, honestly, and even some coworkers, you know, I have some coworkers that purchase some camera systems, and they pen tested the camera system, and they found a way to look at anybody's camera system from anywhere on the internet. Um, that was a Dehua, I believe, uh, exploit that we wrote recently, or a vulnerability that we found. Uh, there's always going to be holes in, in these systems, but the question is, who do you think is going to be, t to be targeting, uh, you know, you, for example? Like, are you, are you going to, if you are a very high profile person using a medical device, I would be really worried because some people are actually trying to get me, you know? But if I was just a person that, you know, uh, I wasn't a high profile person, I wouldn't be as worried because there's, there's some risk assessment that goes on. At the end of the day, I'm, I always think twice about any devices that I'm using. In my own house, I have zero smart devices. I don't have any of these lights or any of that thing. I'm, I'm the most analog person you could find <laughs> when it comes to all this stuff, just because I kind of have trust issues with these things. Because so. I know I can do it. So. I guess a follow-up question. You said that all these devices have been patched. Has it been verified that these have been patched? Because there are certain medical devices that have been recalled and should be out of the medical industry. Yet those devices are still in use because they have to be right. Um, so the verification process for you know figuring out if a vulnerability has been patched is also tricky because you can technically patch against one attack type. You know, and you might have like a a blacklist or something for that kind of attack vector, but if you modify it slightly or if you think a little bit more creatively, you can bypass it. The problem is that people are, like the mentality behind development itself and the way that uh, vulnerabilities are approached is kind of backwards. You know, people are trying to block things that the researcher finds, the one specific thing, but dude, I mean, there's like a million different ways to do this, you know what I mean? So uh, for this device specifically, the vendor assured us, we didn't do any testing, they assured us that the vulnerabilities have been patched and we kind of took their uh, word on it. So, that's as much as I can do, because I don't want to piss them off again. <laughs> Anything else? In the case of this, where it's a, in this case where it was a medical device, was there any other sort of, besides just the company itself, that you felt you needed to reach out to to inform about this, or... So, so is your question, was there other people that we needed to reach out to? I mean, any sort of regulatory or anything? Yeah, actually we did. Uh, we reached out to uh, a couple of organizations, and I honestly don't remember the acronyms right now, but uh, the reason I don't remember is because they didn't respond. Uh, and I tried reaching out to them a couple times. Uh, it, it's, it's really hard to get people to hear you out, and even when you have a POC, when you're like, dude, I mean, I can read and modify anybody's data on this platform. Um, I think the mentality is just they, they don't care unless there's direct financial consequence. There's a direct threat to their livelihood that, oh crap, we're going to lose $15 million. Let's dump this money into penetration testing and to, you know. And that's, like I said earlier, that's the world we live in. We have to threaten their livelihood by losing money, basically, in order for them to invest in these services. Thank you, everybody.